All right, welcome everybody today to this Midday Science Cafe. We are so excited to have you. Today we'll be on fungi and seaweed, changing the way we think about me with Dr. Vayu Maini Rectal and Amanda, Amanda Stiles. So as usual, I will go ahead and get started with a land acknowledgement. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Thank you again for allowing me to make that land acknowledgement. I just wanted to share, um, we always start with a few little updates. One is our next Midday Science Cafe in April will be on recyclable plastics just in time for Earth Day, Earth Week, Earth Month. Now it seems it's become. Um, so stay tuned for that as usual on the third Thursday of every month at noon. So please join us as we talk about recyclable plastics. Before I get started about who I am and who I am here to represent, um, I just wanted to let you know that throughout the entire presentation, you can add your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box, either way is fine. We really encourage dialogue here. We wanna hear from you. We wanna hear your questions and we will present them to our two speakers we have today, um, both in between their talks and at the end, we can have a longer Q&A. So please continue to add your questions there. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that you can find closed captioning um, in Zoom. Uh, this is closed caption. So if you there's a few different ways to find it, but maybe there's a, a three dot button that you can say find closed caption maybe it shows up at the top telling you that you can see a transcript or like i said there's a few different ways so if you have any trouble finding that let us know in the chat the third thing i'll mention is that this is being recorded so we will send this out to everyone who's here and everyone who rsvp'd so that you have this video and you can share it with your friends and family and colleagues. With that said, I will just go ahead and introduce Science at Cal. My name is Dion Rossiter. I'm the executive director of Science at Cal. It's so great to be here. We've been doing these a few years. But Science at Cal originally was envisioned in 2008 as a unifying effort to raise public awareness and understanding and appreciation of science re scientific research at UC Berkeley. To realize this vision, we engage the vast Berkeley STEM community, that's all science, technology, engineering, and mathematicians, the entire community to as science communicators and really to foster, foster creative collaborations, excuse me, among campus and our community-based groups that who share our same commitment for equity and inclusion in STEM education and STEM careers. We connect all of the researchers in, to diverse audiences, including the audiences here that we have today from ages, backgrounds, and different sorts of engagement and learning. Um, so here are a few of our different programs we have. We have lectures that you know you're here now. We're also out in the community. So check out our website um, and learn more about all the things we're doing and who we're working with. With that, I'm gonna hand things over to Berkeley Lab who are our collaborators. Awesome, thanks so much, Dee. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Jen Tang and I am the Director of Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And as a quick refresher for those who are new to the Midday Science Cafe Lecture Series, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 US Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. And we're supported by the DOE's Office of Science and managed by the University of California. And all of the research we conduct at Berkeley Lab is unclassified. Now, since our founding way back in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, we have been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking answers to some of the greatest problems that face humankind. Today, Berkeley Lab employees work together to develop meaningful scientific solutions to the world's most intractable energy and environmental challenges, 
help train the next generation of scientists and engineers, and ensure that those things happen in a manner that benefits everyone. Our main campus is located in the Berkeley Hills, and our close ties to the UC system create a really unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. And in fact, many of the lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses, either as students, postdocs, or professors who might share joint appointments here at the lab. And we're fortunate to have an especially close relationship with UC Berkeley, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across many frontiers. Now, one of the main motivations for creating our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary research that are coming out of our institutions, and we hope you enjoy today's presentation. Dee, I'm going to hand things back over to you. Thanks, Jen. And I'm almost going to immediately hand things over to Bayou. So I'm going to stop sharing and allow him to come up on board while I introduce him. This is our first speaker. Again, Dr. Vayu Maini Rectal. He's a scientist, chef, educator, and current Miller Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. Vayu fell in love with cooking at a young age in his cross cultural home of Stockholm, Sweden. He first moved to the US to work in restaurants, but the flavors, textures, and sensations of the kitchen eventually led him to scientific research. His journey in both cooking and science has brought him to restaurants and laboratories around the world. He recently earned his PhD in biochemistry from Harvard University, where he spent several years studying how bacteria living in the human gut digests food and medicine that humans ingest. Currently, Vayu works at the Joint Bioenergy Institute, where he is characterizing and engineering fungi for all production of sustainable and delicious foods. Vayu collaborates with restaurants and food producers in his research, and he recently spent time working with two Michelin star restaurants, uh, the Alchemist in Copenhagen and at Blue Hill in Stone Bar Blue Hill at Stone Barns in New York, exploring fungi and food. In addition to pushing the boundaries of knowledge in the laboratory, Vayu loves sharing his passion for cooking and science with the public, which is what he is doing here today. So go ahead, Vayu, share your screen and and we can't wait to hear what you have to share with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for everybody attending right now. This is so great to see all the, yeah, all the faces and the names that are familiar and unfamiliar, and I'm really excited to share share the work that I've done and that I'm doing at, at UC Berkeley. And it's actually a really interesting time because I'm right now at the Fungal Genetics Conference out here in California. That is the biggest conference for fungi, uh, academ, you know, people studying fungi in academia and industry alike. And we're all gathered here, to, you know, uh, right now out here in California to talk about fungi. So I'm really excited to continue the conversation with you all and share my work with the public. So again, my name is Vayu and I am a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley. And before I tell you about kind of what I'm doing in the lab and what I work on, I want to talk a little bit about how I got there, because it really will probably help you understand kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I was actually born in Stockholm, Sweden. And this is where my journey to science really began. I grew up in a cross-cultural home. My mom is Indian from Kenya. My dad is Cuban and Norwegian. And the way that I got to know where I came from was through food and cooking. So I fell in love with food at a very young age and I've been cooking ever since. And here's a photo of me holding some beautiful Indian flatbreads that I made at a very young age. So this is where my journey to UC Berkeley actually really started. And when I finished high school, I came to the U.S. to translate what had evolved into a passion and a hobby into actually uh, a career. So I started working in restaurants. I, I, lived, I lived in New York for a year and I worked in restaurants. And I really, really realized that I love food. I love cooking. It's not only something that I like to do at home, but actually something I want to work with for the rest of my life. However, restaurants didn't seem to be the right place to actually live out that passion. And so... Um, I sort of ended up through, um, through conversations and, and experiences that I had in New York uh, applying for college. And I ended up going to moving from New York City to uh, Minnesota to a place called Carleton College. And it's really at Carleton College that I fell in love with, sci with science. Uh, I came to Carleton with a big passion for food and through amazing mentors and professors, they really kind of guided me and made me realize that 
you know what? The things that you learn in physics, biology, and chemistry are actually very similar to cooking in the kitchen. And so all of a sudden, this beautiful connection emerged where I realized that science can really shape food and also shape our understanding of food. And so that's really how I became a scientist. And as a scientist, I've dedicated my career to understanding and working on food. I did my PhD at Harvard University, um, studying gut bacteria. So I became really fascinated with microorganisms that live inside our bodies. And I studied how they help us break down food that we ingest, as well as other molecules. And I finished that my PhD in 2020. And after that, I was really curious about how can I bring together my background in restaurants and cooking and food and my training in biochemistry and in microbiology. And that led me to UC Berkeley, where I was so lucky to be accepted to what's called the Miller Fellowship. The Miller Fellowship is an amazing opportunity for recent PhDs all across science to explore kind of new areas and creative areas of, of research. And it allowed me the freedom and the opportunity to really combine food and science in a new way. And um, I'm just very, you know, very excited and grateful to have this opportunity from, from, from the Miller Institute. So I came to UC Berkeley and I was kind of thinking, okay, I want to work with food and microbes. And after a few weeks, just reading papers and thinking about this, I ended up falling in love with a group of organisms that I had never really thought much about before. And that is the group of organisms called filamentous fungi. And this is what I'll talk about today. How filamentous fungi can be used to make food that's delicious, nutritious, and sustainable. But you might ask, what are filamentous fungi? So filamentous fungi are a group of very diverse organisms that exist all around the world. And you can recognize them in the form of molds and mushrooms. You know, mushrooms that you buy in the store that grow in the forest, molds that you might have, you know, in your home or fruits that you buy. This is sort of what filamentous fungi look like on a macroscopic level. And even though they, uh, molds and mushrooms may look a little bit different to your eye, what they have in common is something called hyphae. So both of these are actually composed of something called hyphae, which are filaments. That's what they call filamentous fungi. Hyphae are basically long fibers or filaments that connect and connect and form a network together. And that network we call mycelium. You can almost think of this as hyphae as muscle fibers that together form a muscle or a tissue. So that is really what a filamentous fungus is. And basically mushrooms are basically just fruits that are made by filamentous fungi. So all filamentous fungi grow in this sort of mycelium hyphae form, and some of them make fruits, like an apple tree makes fruits, make apples. And this is kind of the, um, you know, mushrooms are sort of the fungi fruit, um, but the, what they really share is this hyphae and the mycelium. All right. So fungi are not just kind of a nuisance, you know, I think, I think sometimes they have kind of a bad reputation, like, oh, fungi, they might, they might, they're poisonous or they spoil our food. Fungi actually are really powerful chefs. Some of our favorite foods from all around the world for thousands of years have been produced by filamentous fungi. Cheese, like uh, blue cheese or camembert or brie are made by molds and, and fungi. Tempeh, which you might have tried, which is a food that originated on the island of Java in Indonesia, is also made by a fungus growing on soybeans and miso and soy sauce and sake and many foods from kind of East Asia are also made by fungi, right? So a lot of the flavors that we love and cherish wouldn't be possible without these brilliant microscopic chefs. And why do we use fungi for food? Well, you might have guessed they offer amazing flavors. They're able to really unlock material and create flavors that we love and cherish. They have amazing, interesting textures. You know, think about the texture of, of a cheese. You know, the fungi really can help turn milk into something very different. They're nutritious. Fungi actually can improve the nutrition of foods and on their own have a lot of nutrition. And I think what makes me very excited is that they are very sustainable. They are very good at growing on material, uh, a lot of different materials such as wood. And in that way, we can use various sources to produce fungi. And this is a thought of uh, being a very sustainable food source. 
So that makes me very excited as we think about the future. And so we have all these traditional fungal foods like cheese and tempeh and sake and soy sauce, but the, the, the use of fungi for food has really continued, especially in this era of thinking about finding new alternatives to meat. So a law and, and, and animal agriculture, like a lot of people are thinking, okay, the way that we are raising animals, the way that we're producing meat and dairy is not really friendly to the planet in its current format. And so people are seeking alternatives to that. And fungi is the key ingredient in many of these companies' solution. Um, you have a lot of different companies now that are bringing in a lot of money and developing products that you can buy on the shelf that are made from mycelium and fungi. And I'm not involved in these companies and I have no stake in them, but I think it's really exciting that there's sort of this new era of fungal foods that, are emer that is emerging. And that is kind of where I situate myself. I'm thinking about, okay, we have these traditional uses of fungi, you know, where, where can it go in the future? What, what are sort of the possibilities? And so I'm going to tell you about sort of briefly about two research areas that I work in, where I'm trying to harness fungi for sustainable food production. The first one is we are using fungi mycelium as a meat alternative. And the second one is using fungi to convert food waste or side streams into human food. So first, let me talk to you about the meat alternatives. So what you can see here, um, is that we can actually grow mycelium in liquid culture. So on the left, you have a, a, a flask uh, and where I have grown mycelium. And the mycelium grows very rapidly. You can see kind of this, this is a little blob. And then on the right, you can see that we can collect that mycelium in a tube. And then what's really cool is actually, you can see that uh, you can see the mycelium there. We can touch it. It looks a little bit like raw chicken. We can then put it in a pan. And that mycelium is really cool because it has this fibrous texture to it. It browns nicely in the pan. You know, something that we really, really love uh, about, uh, about protein is kind of, uh, fungi can really bring that, okay? So this is just to show you that fungi sort of can, can mimic uh, animal meat uh, on, a, on a textural level. And this is exactly what many companies are doing. They're taking that mycelium, they're mixing it with, by a, a, a number of different ingredients because the mycelium itself okay it has a nice texture but let's add some binders to sort of compress it let's add some flavors let's add some colors and that is sort of how you can go from mycelium to making a meat and this is sort of how companies right now are producing mycelium based products however this here in the middle adding ingredients adding effort, adding processing steps, it leads to increased cost and a longer ingredient label. And so my idea, my thought is, you know, maybe it would be interesting if we could eliminate the extra steps after we harvest the mycelium and just use the mycelium on its own, you know, no extra processing needed. So my research explores the use of how we can use genetic engineering or bioengineering these modern biotechnological tools to program the fungus on a genetic level to change its food and culinary properties its nutrition its texture and its flavor for example and so the idea is to use methods like crispr cas9 which is this gene scissors to cut dna and to modify it to make a more affordable and more accessible and more delicious product so I will talk to you about now kind of the general approach. We take an edible filamentous fungus and we've developed a method using CRISPR-Cas9. And this is the method, this gene editing method that won the Nobel Prize for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and US Berkeley, uh, um, UC Berkeley scientist Jennifer Doudna a few years ago. And we can then introduce a new gene into the genome. Okay, this is kind of the general idea. The red thing goes into the genome. So we have used this approach to, to a fungus called Aspergillus oryzae. So Aspergillus oryzae is a delicious fungus traditionally used to make soy sauce and miso in East Asia, but now it's actually used in meat alternatives by a company here in Berkeley. And also there's companies in Europe that use this fungus. It's really delicious. It's nutritious. It has a high umami and we love it. So what we did is we went into the DNA of this organism and we cut the DNA and we then introduced a new gene. 
And we focused on the gene that makes heme. Heme, you might have heard about because that is what makes a red meat red. And that is what Impossible Burger, Impossible Foods is using as their secret ingredient to make this uh, meat sort of substitute that's available now all over the United States. They are using heme as a secret ingredient because it's thought to add a meat-like flavor to the, to the mix. So we basically um, modified the organism and to then overproduce heme, to make more heme. And I will say that the fungus already makes heme, right? So all we're doing is actually just making, a, sort of tricking it to make more of this. And what we were able to do is to actually take this fungus that looks kind of white and off yellow and turn it to make, to look red. And very much when I touch it and feel it, it looks and feels a lot like red meat. And so this is kind of the overall idea is maybe we could use these approaches to make fungi more affordable, more accessible, and also more delicious. So now I just wanna spend a few minutes talking about the second part, and that is about how we can take fungi and transform food waste. So the idea here is that when we grow food, not all of, it, all of it makes it into the food chain. We have the pl a plant, for example, and some of the plant will eat, like the leaves, and some of it will throw out. But what if we could take this stuff that we throw out, this so-called waste, and convert it back into human food? And fungi would be perfect for that. So the idea is to take food waste, incubate it with fungi, and all of a sudden get delicious and nutritious human food made from things that we traditionally throw out. And so in this work, I'm really exploring this idea in collaboration with various restaurants. So I spent two months at Alchemist in Copenhagen in the fall, experimenting with fungi and various food products, including waste, and how we can convert these waste into food. And we had some really interesting, delicious results. And then the other um, uh, area that I've recently started collaborating with is Blue Hill at Stone Barns in New York, where we're taking spent brewer's grain from breweries and thinking about how fungi can help make that more nutritious, both for humans, but also actually for animals. And so that is everything that I have today. And I'm really excited to continue the conversation with you in the Q&A about fungi and food, about various possibilities in this world. Wonderful, thank you so much. And we do have some great questions coming in. So please continue to add those questions. All right, let me pull up the questions so that I have them. <laughs> okay, you've worked in, in scientific research labs at the universities and in Michelin star restaurants. How are these worlds different or similar? And how do you see these worlds fitting together by you? Wow, that's like one of my favorite questions. So um, I would say that actually being a scientist and working in a restaurant is on some, in some ways very similar. You're using your hands, you're you know, trying to be creative, you're, you know, you're testing things out and then reporting on the results and then evaluating and, and, and progressing. And I, but, but one key difference in that process is that in a restaurant, it tends to be a faster timeline. You know, the research that we're doing at UC Berkeley, maybe, or in my PhD, it can take several years because we're really going down to the deepest detail level and sort of really taking time to figure out the system that we're studying. And in a restaurant, it might actually move a little bit faster. So that's a difference that I, that I really noticed. But at the same time, there's similarities. And I think that's why I love working in both worlds. I started in the kitchen. So the transition to the laboratory is actually not too different. Now, where I see them really fitting together is that I think there's a there's sort of two worlds right now, right? They're, they're very separate, right? The restaurants are really innovating with the, with the material that is food and they understand the beauty and the flavor and the texture and the culture of food. But maybe in that restaurant, it's only accessible to a small group of people who can pay a lot of money. On the other side, there's a lot of scientists that are trying to make food. For example, in Silicon Valley, scientists are hacking food in the lab and, and you know, trying to develop new future foods. And what I think what they're able to do is to make it accessible, affordable, but maybe they could benefit from actually talking to chefs in terms of making it delicious. I'm thinking about the beauty, the culture, the, the background of food, right? That's what we love. That's what, you know, food is part of who we are and we can't lose that when we, when we use science to make food. And so what I really hope to create or be part of is a space where chefs and scientists together write the DNA 
of the next wave of sustainable food that you have in one sort of room, scientists who are pipetting and growing things. And in the other room, you have chefs who are actually part of innovating together. Right now, they're very separate. I think they're, they, they operate on very different wavelengths. And I would love for these worlds to come together to drive the innovation of, of food in the future. You sold me. You're so passionate and excited. I'm, it's like, yes, value, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I care about this this a lot, and I just think I think there's something there, right? There's we, yeah, we we oh, can't love that. you know it's these two thing. worlds are so separate, and they, why should they have to? Everybody's talking about sustainable food and what is the key recipe for the future, and let's let's invite the scientists and the chefs to the same table to innovate together. All right, and I totally agree. And speaking of that, this question is an important one, almost on the opposite side of the spectrum here. How do you test whether or not the fungus you produced are actually or develop are actually safe to eat? How do you know that when you're producing? Right, so it's, it's, that's a really good question, and it comes up quite a bit. So in my work, um, I only use fungi that have historic, historically been consumed by humans for thousands of years, where we know that they are safe and they are tasty, right? So I'm not necessarily going out in the environment and taking a fungus and saying, oh, let's try this. Instead, I'm sticking to fungi that we know are safe to consume and are consumed by thousands and millions of people around the world. Now, of course, when we start modifying and growing it in different ways or growing it on different substrates, we can use scientific methods such as you know, analytical methods to measure potential molecules that might be produced that are not good or, or, or things like that, right? So I would say that for, for me, it's really important to ground myself in the tradition and the sort of ancient practice and, and use that as a sort of safeguard to know that it's not gonna be completely toxic, but then we can add, as I said, measurements to sort of make sure, okay, is this actually safe to eat? Is this actually going to be, you know, a viable product? Yeah. And here's like a, a little bit of a follow-up question because these are two are kind of similar before we hand things over um, to Jen. Is it safe to um, consume the fungi biomass directly in the liquid source or do you need, do you need to treat it first or could you just drink it? So, um, it is in, uh, theoretically safe to consume the fungi sort of in the, in the liquid source. There's a small nuance to that, and it's sort of a scientific nuance that I will just bring up in case people are interested. So in sort of the industrial setting, when they produce fungal meat on a large scale, um, it is safe to eat. But if you're just eating the mycelium sort of raw, it, uh, if you eat too much of it, it's not good for your body because it has a lot of RNA. It's a nucleotide molecule. The fungus grows so fast that it makes this molecule called RNA. And so if you eat too much of the fungus without treating it, then you know, that can cause problems in your body. However, if you wanna you know, eat a lot of fungus and make it into you know, a staple uh, uh, on your plate, then um, the, the way we do it is we heat treat the fungus. So we harvest it and then quickly heat it at 70 degrees Celsius or so for a short amount of time. And that actually allows the fungus to spit out all the RNA and then it's safe to consume. And this is actually, that was the, this is a method that was developed in the 60s and 70s. You know, I'm doing this fungal work now. This has been part of a long history of people trying to make fungal foods that started in the 60s. And so we know there that, yes, it's safe, but we might have to apply some quick modifications if we want to incorporate it into our diet as a massive food source. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that clarification as well. And right now we'll hand things over to Jen Tang and Dr. Amanda Stiles. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Take it away, thank Jen. You. Thanks. And why you fantastic presentation. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker to the screen. Actually, she's already here, Dr. Amanda Stiles. Now, Amanda is a co-founder and the chief technology officer at Umaro Foods, which is a California food tech company that's developing a new alternative protein source for plant-based foods. It's from ocean harvest and seaweeds, in fact. Now, as you'll hear more about in a bit, Umaro Foods protein powder enhances the color, texture, and flavor of plant-based foods. And Umaro is soon going to be launching its first product, which is a delicious bacon, a plant-based bacon to the market. Before she was at Umaro, Amanda led the research team at Ripple Foods, which is a plant-based alternative dairy company. And she believes that the best way to encourage people to eat more plant-based foods instead of factory farmed animals is by making plant-based foods taste amazing. 
And we're looking forward to hear more about that. Amanda, over to you. Great, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about seaweed protein, uh, which we believe is the protein of the future. So uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm gonna reiterate a few points of that really quick. My background is in plant molecular biology and uh, my overall goal is to find ways to make really delicious plant-based foods that are so delicious people would rather eat them than the animals, uh, the animal foods that we, we currently eat. So prior to co-founding Umaro Foods, I worked at Ripple Foods making plant-based dairy milk. Um, and making ultra pure pea protein to, to basically bolster the, the protein level of that milk. And now at Umaro Foods, we're working on developing a completely new protein source and developing plant-based meat from that uh, new protein source. So to start out, I am part of LBL's Cyclotron Road division. And this division, the goal is to support entrepreneurial scientists uh, as they advance technology projects with the potential for global impact. So essentially that means turning science into companies, turning scientists into entrepreneurs. There's so much exciting science that's happening in our institutions and it's helping to bring the people that are developing that science uh, into the marketplace to make a real impact. And Cyclotron Road is focusing on uh, projects that, that really will have a big impact. And I was excited to see that you'll be hearing from another uh, Cyclotron Road fellow next month. Aaron Hall is also in the program. And this program is supported by the Activate Fellowship. So I encourage you to check out the website, activate.org. It has a lot of really interesting projects that are, are supported um, bringing technology to product. So today I'm going to give an, a quick overview of our mission, what our goals are at Umaro Foods. I'm gonna tell you about seaweed protein, and then I'm gonna talk about our first product, which is just about to hit the market. So starting out, a protein revolution is underway. Uh, I think all of you have seen that plant-based uh, plant foods are on the rise. They've really been hitting the market. Uh, people are excited about Beyond Meat and Possible Foods, and a number of those companies that, that Bayou showed as well. And people's appetite for protein has been steadily growing. And we also see that animal protein is very hard on the environment and we're looking for solutions. So the alternative protein market is expected to grow to 85 billion within the next decade. And right now, this is where we get our protein. We get our protein from animals, as you can see here on the left, um, from land animals, from ocean animals, and from land plants. But ocean plants is a huge white space and it's an amazing place to get protein. So we wanna fill that white space. Why is it such an amazing place for protein? Uh, first, the productivity. Ocean plants can make five times more protein per acre than soybeans. And nitrogen, which is the building block of protein, is mostly in our ocean. So almost 80% of the available nitrate is present in the ocean. So essentially it just makes sense to be getting our protein from the ocean. Seaweed's an ideal protein to feed the planet. It doesn't require any land, no fresh water, no synthetic fertilizers. Uh, the protein is high quality. It has all the essential amino acids. It's a natural source of B12 uh, and it has a delicious umami flavor. Um, the market is growing. So you can see on, this, uh, on the right here that the global production of seaweed has been steadily increasing over the past two decades. And it's also a sustainable ocean-friendly crop. So the, it's supported by both the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Fund. Essentially, we're building, uh, we're building forests underwater. And this is a great, uh, a great way to support uh, the, the wildlife underwater. Really quick, I'm gonna talk a little bit about seaweed. There's three main types. There's essentially red, green, and brown. We're focused on the red seaweed. So that's where I'm going to, it's mostly what I'll talk about today. There's over 7,000 species of red seaweeds. Seaweeds are composed primarily of protein and carbohydrates. So the protein can range anywhere from five to 40% and the carbohydrates around 45 to 75%. Uh, I was really shocked when I first learned about seaweeds and realized they could be up to 40%. Uh, nori, the seaweed that is wrapped around sushi, is actually up to 40%. So that's much higher than even soybeans. 
So focusing on the red seaweeds, these are a few that we look at, dulse, nori, ogo, and sea moss. They have a range of protein um, and they're currently used for different reasons. So dulse, uh, a lot of people have heard of dulse, the seaweed that tastes like bacon, it had some popularity. It is really delicious. I've put it in the air fryer and it tastes amazing. Uh, nori is the seaweed that you see wrapped around sushi. Uh, ogo is sometimes you see in your poke bowls uh, and sea moss is uh, gaining in popularity right now. There's a lot of um, companies right now that are focused on just giving you sea moss drinks. Um, they're primarily used for different purposes at the moment. So dulse and nori are primarily used for food, whereas ogo and sea moss are primarily used for their different hydrocolloids like agar, agarose, and carrageenan. Our primary focus right now is on nori and ogo, and this is because they're grown in high quantities and they're also tend to be higher in proteins than the others. So we can get up to 45% in nori and up to 30% in ogo. And as we extract protein, that's important for us. Uh, a lot of people ask what makes the seaweed red? So the main thing that makes it red is this protein called phycoerythrin. Phycoerythrin, uh, basically you can see in the picture on the left here, that's uh, a picture of the, the outer part of the seaweed. And it has these light harvesting uh, molecules all the way at the ends. So having this phycoerythrin, which absorbs blue light and reflects red, allows red seaweeds to uh, grow farther, farther underwater than other seaweeds because the blue light is able to penetrate farther. Um, but the upshot of what's interesting to us is most of the protein that we extract from red seaweeds is this phycoerythrin. So around 60% of it can be phycoerythrin, which makes our protein red. And just to add on here, we're using ocean grown seaweed. A lot of people, when they hear seaweed, uh, they class us in with, uh, with microalgae because microalgae has been a very popular uh, crop over the past decade or so, especially for biofuels. Um, but uh, microalgae is primarily grown in tanks, whereas what we're growing is grown in the ocean. So this is a, uh, a picture of some people harvesting macroalgae. It's big, it's grown in the ocean like row crops and it's large scale and low cost. And we use it to make the meatiest proteins. So this is what we're doing. We're making a seaweed protein concentrate. So what you see on the left is starting with 20% protein in the seaweed, concentrating that protein out to make a new alternative protein that's 65% protein. And we're pioneers in the space. So right now we're the only company to produce seaweed protein at scale. So this is a, a quick snapshot into one of our pilot scale facilities where essentially we're doing this separation step. And then on the right, you can see a bag of our purified protein powder that's 65% protein. Here's a picture of our seaweed protein. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the protein itself. So why is it a great fit for plant-based meat? Um, there's a number of reasons. The most exciting to me, and to be honest, was a complete surprise is the red to brown color change during cooking. So as we talked about in the last presentation, um, that heme that Impossible food Foods uses uh, aids in that, tr that transformation from red to brown. And this is something we can do by just adding our protein. It also has a high water holding capacity. It concentrates the B12 in the protein concentrate. It helps to bind things together. So it has a good um, good binding ability to keep all the ingredients in the burger together, and you can't taste it. Um, one of the things that we're looking at with our protein is taking advantage of the, essentially the sea flavors as we look at making different seafoods. But for something like a burger, we don't want our burgers to taste like seafood. So we're working in both directions, both accentuating those flavors and removing those flavors so that we can have a really versatile protein. The plant-based meat category is the fastest growing uh, plant-based category. It's worth 1.4 billion right now and growing at 45%. And this is a picture of our first product. So this is our Umaro bacon. It's made with red seaweed protein and bacon is a $60 billion market worldwide right now, which we're very excited to get it on the market soon. Uh, and here's a picture of our branding and what our package will look like. So we'll be selling a pre-cooked bacon uh, with, uh, with about eight to 10 strips in a package. And our overall goal is to build a food system that supports the planet, starting with the ocean. 
So overall, our goal is to make seaweed protein the most environmentally friendly, friendly, affordable, and abundant source of protein on earth. So I wanna say thank you to everybody for listening to the talk today. And also a thank you to Activate and Cyclotron Road because this is the way that we can use science to make a difference, to make a global impact on the world. So please visit us at umarofoods.com. There's a link to pre-order our bacon and I'm happy to answer any questions either now or if you'd like to email me. Uh, thanks Amanda so much for your presentation. We're definitely getting some comments in the, uh, the chat asking about how they can taste your bacon. So. Perfect. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a link to pre-orders Amanda mentioned. So I wanted to ask you just a couple questions before we bring Bayou and Dee back to the screen. And the first is, you know, you talk about harvesting seaweed. Are there any concerns about over harvesting seaweed from the ocean? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, overall, I would say that that's not something that's uh, that's come up before. So we're really looking at how to how to increase the farming of this uh, of seaweed. One of the really useful things about seaweed is that uh, along our coastal systems, there's a lot of runoff from fertilizer and that's really detrimental to the, the ecosystem. And seaweed, uh, so being able to connect the two, essentially farming seaweed on our coasts where you have this excess uh, of nitrogen, which is detrimental and allowing it to essentially be fertilizer for the seaweed farms itself is, uh, is a win-win situation. So you create a, a great habitat for organisms as you're producing the seaweed and uh, suck up some of the excess, uh, excess fertilizer in the ocean. And uh, it's, it's win-win. So no, we're, I, I think that question probably stems from the idea that we would be going into the, the wild grown seaweed um, sections and, and over harvesting from there, but, but that's not the way that it works. We're essentially looking at a, a farming system where we cultivate seaweed specifically um, to be grown as a crop and then harvest it. Uh, many seaweeds as well can be semi-harvest. So essentially you go through partially harvest them. So you're not destroying the habitat that you've created, but you're partially harvesting and allowing the, the overall seaweed forest to keep growing while you harvest. Got it. Thanks for, for making that clarification. I think that's really helpful. Um, so why, why did you decide to make bacon as your first product using seaweed protein? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It, there is a couple reasons. Um, I'd say the first one is because most people haven't heard of seaweed protein. Uh, you know, it's, it's totally new. Uh, it's going to be a new thing on the market and uh, new things can be a little weird. So what better way to introduce it to the market than in the form of everyone's favorite food? I mean, <laughs> bacon has, has cult status. Everybody loves bacon. We've made a really good one and coupled it with our protein. And so that's part of it, just introducing our protein in the most delicious way possible. Um, and then on the other side, we did, uh, as we were prototyping with our protein and with some of the seaweed hydrocolloids, we realized that we could make a really nice fat mimetic with our seaweed hydrocolloids. So in our bacon, we actually have a mix of both the protein and the hydrocolloids. Um, we're able to get that really nice uh, sort of chewy burst in your mouth, uh, fatty flavor of bacon using the other part of the seaweeds in addition to the protein. So it was a, a mix of both. We wanna make a really great introduction to seaweed protein and wow, seaweed protein and hydrocolloids make a really good bacon. <laughs> I, I have not had lunch yet and this, this is <laughs> killing me. <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you for those great answers. We have a ton of questions. So why don't we go ahead and bring Dee and Bayou back to the screen and we'll get started. Um, and Jocelyn, maybe I'll, or sorry, Dee, I'm gonna hand it over to you to, uh, to ask the first questions. Sure, I, I like this question, Bayou. What are some of the current challenges regarding the filamentous fungi as a new food? That's a great question. Um, I think honestly is, is, is sort of the, the big challenge to really get this on people's plates is how can we scale it up? You know, how can we grow enough of them in a way that is affordable for people to actually buy? Um, and so I think that's a big challenge that people are working on, you know, with mushrooms, uh, aside for, for example, aside from the button mushroom, which is quite automated and quite affordable. You know, oyster mushrooms, lion's mane mushrooms, other mushrooms, they're quite labor intensive to grow. And we haven't yet really figured out how to do it in an automated sort of scaled up way 
to make the production uh, if, uh, if as efficient as it as it should be to make it as affordable as it, as it should be. So that I think is a sort of a big challenge. And I think a lot of food companies and people in this space are facing that, right? So we can make a sample, a prototype, but when we really want to produce food at a large scale, it's a different sort of science and a different set of challenges. The other thing I think is um, how to really kind of unlock the most uh, brilliant texture and flavor from the material. So I think there's you know a lot of science that have to, has to be done, but at the same time, as I said, we have to think about what it tastes like, what it looks like, what it feels like. That is how we change behavior. I mean, you know, personally, I might be motivated by sustainability when I buy something for the first time, but it's not what brings me back. And so I think flavor and that sensory dimension is a challenge in fungal foods and probably in, in you know, other sort of alternative future food sources as well. So thank you for that question. Yeah, and your first half, kind of can lead into the second question, which you did address, but this question is specifically asking, how do you envision, which I don't think you, you mentioned, how do you envision scaling up? Well, so, this is actually, this one's about use of mycelium and combining with food waste actually. So that's a scale problem on the other side of things too, right? Right. So how so, do you envision scaling up that space? So like kind of how to scale up mycelium, food waste based exactly. products. Yep. And, um, Honestly, that's a, that's a big question. I think a lot, you know we know how to do this on a small scale. A lot of restaurants have been really innovative in this in this space. You know, taking vegetable scraps and turning into vinegar. Or when I was at the Basque Culinary Center, which is this really innovative, really beautiful institute for kind of culinary gastronomy and science in 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 Basque country, Spain. They were doing a lot of kind of on a smaller scale of like, hey, let's take whey that's left over from yogurt making and we can turn it into uh, alcohol or liquor, or we can take old bread and turn it into miso. But when you think about doing that on a large scale, you know, it's a number of challenges that come up. It's like the logistics, you know, how, how are you going to transport the waste that you want to use or side stream? I actually want to use the word side stream. So, you know, transport, right? If, if you want to use uh, spent brewer's grain, how are you going to transport all that spent brewer's grain? How is it going to, you know, hold its shape and, and nutrition during that transport? And then, you know, what are the sort of vessels that we need to use to, to grow the fungi on that waste? I think a lot of it now is kind of thinking about, okay, the logistical side, sort of supply chains, coordination, but also we don't necessarily have a template for how to grow these fungi in the most efficient way, in the, in the best possible way on these side streams. And so I think there's a lot of innovation that might need to happen in that sense. Okay, maybe there's a new reactor that we have to build or a new vessel that we have to build that allows us to scale up and do this more efficiently. Because I think a lot of it can be done on a small scale in a restaurant and I've seen really amazing work down there, but we're still sort of, I think that's a new space, right? How do we do this on a large massive scale? Yeah, awesome. we, we have some ideas in the chat about how to do that too. <laughs> All right, Jen. Thanks. Yeah, you know, since we're talking about scale up and we're talking about, you know, um, you know, other streams. So Amanda, we got a couple questions for you. So how how big of a seaweed farm would you need to, you know, to produce uh, products like bacon? You know, for example, and I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, somebody asked, how big of a farm would you need to replace all the protein we get right now from cows in the US in a given time period, maybe a year? Yeah, I think that's a super interesting question. So um, we've done the calculations ourselves, and um, to replace all of the, the protein in the US, it would take a seaweed farm that's about the size of a small city. And um, another scientist I just, uh, I just noticed uh, recently did a analysis of what it would take if you wanted to get all the world's protein from, um, from seaweed. And it would be, I think he said 180,000 square kilometers. So basically the size of a small state to replace all of our protein. And, um, and from their calculations as well, that actually uh, a seaweed farm that size would, would um, increase the alkalinity of the ocean enough to uh, mitigate the acidification from the industrial revolution. So I haven't verified those, uh, those claims myself, but it certainly sounds exciting. Wow, yeah, that's, that's fascinating to hear. Um, so I think in your talk, you talked, uh, you know, about um, isolating the proteins in seaweed. Uh, if the proteins only, you know, maybe 30 to 40% of the product, we imagine there might be some byproducts. So do you, do you have an idea about how you could use some of the byproducts that result from isolating the proteins and how much uh, byproduct do you, do you generate at Umaro? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the interesting thing about seaweed is that right now, the seaweeds that we're using are mostly used for their hydrocolloids. So essentially, um, essentially in other industries, the, they take the seaweed, they pull out the hydrocolloid, and the protein is the waste product. So right now, that, that co-product is, really, uh, is really valuable to us. So with the OGO, for example, um, the, the rest of the seaweed is mostly agar. And so there's a, there's a good market for that. And um, we also were interested in using it in some of our foods. So we're definitely using, uh, using the co-products and making sure to uh, do our best to use all of the seaweed and to take advantage of all of it. Great, thanks. Um, let me ask a question for, for both you and Bayou. You know, there, there are a lot of um, similarities and differences between let's say cell-based or lab-grown or cultured meat and, and plant-based meat. Can you talk a little bit about um, the differences and the similarities between the two and why it's important to sort of understand why there, why there are two differences or why there, why there are differences and similarities? Sure. Um, from my perspective, I think they're both exciting, um, both exciting fields. Um, you know, I think we're at early stages with uh, with some of the cell based, whereas plant based is is here now. And so, from our perspective, we're we're excited to get something on the market. Um, you know, in a in a week or two, in a couple of weeks, and cell based has a lot of promise for the future. So, um, you know, I'd say I'm excited for both, and I think they both have a lot of potential. And love to hear Bayou's uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think with cell-based meat, kind of what you were uh, alluding to, Amanda, uh, it's far away. I think there's a lot of money going into it. I think there's a lot of sort of excitement around it. I do think the question of how can we make it, how can we scale up cell-based meat? That is a real challenge that people are facing. And how can we do that at a price point that is actually affordable to people like us and not just to consumer that, consumers at high-end Michelin star restaurants. And I think that is something that I'm still waiting to see, you know, how, how are the economics gonna play out? Um, how, how is it actually gonna look at the end of the day? So I think we're, we're still waiting for that answers and it's still evolving, but I think, you know, plant-based is, is definitely here and it's here to stay and there's, it's, it's a rapidly evolving space. Um, I would say, you know, I, I am very excited about mycelium and I am seeing more and more mycelium based companies come around. And I think, you know, one, advantage that mycelium has and it also has you know challenges like every approach is that we don't you know we don't have to purify anything so we can just grow our mycelium and we eat that as opposed to having them to extract or process the mycelium to get something from it so the way that you know pea protein is used for or that, that's made from uh, for the beyond burger for example is their peas are grown and then you have to kind of extract the protein to put it um, and um, mycelium, I think, is exciting because it offers a potential to just grow the mycelium and that's what you eat. However, right now we have to still add some other ingredients to make it delicious and nutritious. So um, I, th I think mycelium is also here to stay, but it's a, I think it's a more, uh, it's a newer kind of uh, field as, as compared to plant-based. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and follow up that paired question with another paired question, question which is, Maybe folks in the audience are wondering this too. You're both working on getting alternative meat into the market. What's the connection between the two efforts? May there be a fusion between mycelium and seaweed in the future? Either can answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll answer that first. Um, I think absolutely. So, you know, as we're making new plant-based products, um, we're really excited about adding new textures. So, um, so we're... I wouldn't say we're actively right now looking at that um, that combination, but mixing seaweed protein with mycelium, uh, you know, that fibrous structure that um, the Bayou spoke about, um, we're we're excited about it. I think in the the plant based sector, bringing a lot of different uh, products together is is a great way to to make the best products. Yeah, I definitely I agree with that. I think. You know, I think I think so. An area I think Amanda alluded to this earlier, but an area that is still not. Um, really doesn't yet have really good alternatives to seafood and uh, i'm actually pescatarian myself so i grew up eating seafood and stuff and i think i became really aware of this gap my, my partner became allergic to shellfish and fish the past year and kind of realizing okay what are the alternatives out there and that has gotten me thinking about the potential of fungi to kind of fill that niche you know with their interesting textures their ability to grow interesting shapes um, but i think they would have to include seaweed because the flavors and 
uh, the, the kind of nutritional value of seaweed. I think, I think there's a clear synergy there. And I'm really, you know, maybe Amanda and I will explore that together. But I, I totally think that that should be explored. And, and, and maybe seaweed could be the, the product that that moves towards. Um, I can't see why not. Lovely. I love that. Um, you know, you were speaking just now even about your, your time in those Michelin star restaurants and making it accessible and all that. And it's hard to sort of imagine what, what were the actual products that were being produced and did any of at those restaurants and did any of them actually make it on the menu? Yeah. So at Alchemist, um, you know, we, we, we worked quite hard at this to kind of figure out, okay, what, what are some interesting new, new fungal sort of derived products that can, that can be, you know, introduced. And um, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're sort of in the later stages of development. We have kind of two prototypes. One of them is, so, so sort of one of the ideas was, what if we take, instead of taking the edible fungi that we always use, like, you know, chefs sort of have a toolkit of two or three fungi that they will use. So what if we look beyond that to the diversity of the fungal kingdom and look at other edible fungi that are not traditionally you know, used in kitchens, but have been used by humans for a long time. And one of those fungi I work with, and it's actually grown on food waste in Indonesia. It's called onchom. The product is a traditional use of taking food waste and converting it into human food. That fungus we introduced in the rest, we, we started working with in the restaurant. And there we have some interesting kind of fermented uh, products that are in development. One of them is kind of a cashew based cheese almost that, lo that looks you know, like a cheese and the fungus grows on it and breaks down the fat and the protein and forms a really nice rind on the cheese and the, the fungus is orange. So that's something I think we're kind of exploring and developing. And the other one is um, um, growing the, my, uh, just growing mycelium of fungi. They have a bioreactor in the restaurant. They actually have like a tank that we can grow fungi in. And so we have grown some uh, Aspergillus oryzae uh, there, uh, the fungus that I work with, just the, the regular fungus. And uh, that is uh, probably going to make it into kind of a cocktail, a small boba pearls, because the fungus grows as boba pearls. It's still, we're still sort of deciding on, you know, how to best uh, explore this, but they're actually working at it at Alchemist and we're, we're in continuous dialogue. Um, but they, you know, the question then is how do we serve 50 guests a night every day of the week? So we're still trying to figure out the, the scale up on that side, but uh, really excited to see, you know, to see what comes out of it. Yeah, definitely. All right. One more question before we hand it back to, to Jen um, and Amanda. How does the concentration of heme in your preparation compare with the concentration of heme we actually consume in meat? And this person is asking this question because um, of findings that suggest too much heme consumption may be associated with colon cancer. It's a great question. And I really you know, appreciate uh, you for raising that. Uh, we're still kind of... Uh, kind of comparing the heme levels to impossible burger and pork and beef. So I don't have those data right now. We're going to get those back in the coming weeks. And of course, we want to kind of know where we're at relative to other food products to make sure we're not too high or, you know, uh, in a way that could be toxic. So that is an active area of investigation. And I think it's a really important consideration, of course, to, to, to sort of measure um, where we're at. So I don't have the answer, but hopefully I will soon. All right, Amanda, we've got a couple questions in the chat wondering about next products that Umaro might think to develop using seaweed protein. Uh, I think there is a request I saw for maybe an ahi tuna, but uh, taking a step back, can you talk with us about, you know, whether there are other products in the pipeline that you're thinking about and what other foods could seaweed protein improve? Yeah, great question. Um, so, it's, it's really a, a sky is the limit sort of answer. Uh, our goal with seaweed protein is to, is to both take advantage of all the, the specialty um, functionalities it has right now, the red, the, the seaweed flavors that we can enhance um, and some of the functionalities, but also to make a protein that's, that's decolorized and deflavorized and can fit basically anywhere that, that soy protein can fit. So for next products, you know, a lot of that depends on, on market. So we're, we're thinking about it from a company perspective. Um, a good place for us to go would be to continue in the breakfast category. So, you know, we're playing around with making, um, making breakfast sausages, that sort of thing. Um, but another direction is the seafood category. 
Uh, I think as someone mentioned the uh, the raw tuna, we've we've played around with both that and shrimp um, with you know initial prototypes, and I think it'd be very it'd be very promising to to make some of those. So, you know, we're we're at early stages now with prototyping to see what we we can make, and then figure out what the best um, the best combination of we can make a really good shrimp and this is the market size for it, or we can make a really good ahi tuna and and get it out. Um, some some things that I never thought about, um, you know, on the business side are just logistics and things like that. So um, making an ahi tuna is really exciting, but it's also uh, logistically a bit of a challenging market to get into. Just um, just shipping it, getting it to to the different markets, and it's not that large of a market. Um, so so there's a bit of a business perspective as well that we think about. But overall, our goal is to make this protein. Um, go anywhere that soy can go. So sky's the limit. That's awesome. Um, so somebody asked if there are any concerns about seaweed farming and creating you know, sort of monocultures that might be detrimental to surrounding ecosystems. Um, have there been any issues with pests or pathogens um, like you see with, with land-based monocultures? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, to be honest, I think the best person to, to ask would be my co-founder because she is the seaweed expert and I'm the protein expert. But um, I, I can say that, you know, it is it is grown as a commodity crop and certainly we're, uh, as a commodity crop, we'll have to look out for the same concerns and the same issues that you would um, with any other type of crop. And, you know, monocultures are, are a scary thing and there's a lot of issues around there. So I think that that's something that as the industry scales up, they will want to not replicate some of the issues of land-based crops and, you know, take, take all the learnings that we have from land-based crops and, um, and apply them to sea-based. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to avoid it. It doesn't have to be a monoculture. Right now, a lot of people are looking at integrated systems where you have multiple types of seaweeds growing at once, where you have um, both an oyster farm and a seaweed farm together. Um, and, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of different directions, but but as the industry grows, it's um, it's something that's really important and will have to be evaluated. Got it. Thank you. Um, so another question for for both of you, um, thinking about the nutritional value, do do mushrooms or seaweeds contain valuable trace elements or other food supplements that um, that could be beneficial for humans? Uh, seaweeds definitely do. Um, their bioactive uh, components. There's just tons and tons of data on the, the bioactive components. Um, sometimes it almost seems ridiculous to me how many things uh, seaweeds are said to, to help with. So I think that's, um, that's really an exciting, exciting field to, to keep exploring. Um, for, the, for the specific trace elements that we look at, you know, we know that it has um, B12, we know that it has iron, um, those are some of the things that we look at, but for the most part, our focus is is focusing on the protein, and then that's sort of a secondary thing to look at what the other um, components are in the seaweed. Um, and before Bio answers, do you mind just giving a quick definition of what bioactive means for our audience? Sure. Um, so it basically means, um, in in this context, anything, uh, any of the small molecules or small peptides or anything in the seaweed that helps with different different health conditions. So I've seen it um, being used as a anti-cancer, um, an antiviral. I saw a paper coming out about how seaweed might um, help, help with COVID. Uh, there's just hundreds of papers where people have taken seaweed and used it uh, to, to mitigate different health conditions. And um, I think that the field is huge and it's not my specialty, but it's, it's definitely exciting to see what the possibilities are. Excellent, thank you guys. So Vayu, um, what are the advantages of using fungi compared to, you know, for example, plants, because that's usually what we're using in terms of future foods. What are the advantages of using fungi instead of plants? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. And before I answer that in detail, I just kind of wanted to piggyback on uh, what Amanda was saying and kind of thinking about nutritional value of, of fungi and stuff. I think, you know, I think similar to what Amanda was saying about how there's so much research and so many papers on this thing curing everything kind of between the, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you know, every, every sort of a lot of different health conditions. I think 
I think with fungi, it's a similar thing, right? A lot of people take lion's mane mushroom supplements for brain boosting, and you have all these mushroom coffees and sort of, and there are certainly a lot of bioactives in, 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 in mushrooms and in fungi that, you know, could potentially benefit us. I would say that, you know, as a scientist, I think we're always, we're always looking for the silver bullet. You know, what's that one thing that's going to help me, you know, help us fix this, this, or this. And I don't necessarily think that, you know, fungi, even though I love them, are a cure for all, even though there's literature and sort of, I guess there's a lot of sort of hype around what they're, what they're able to do. I just want to caution against, against that and sort of remind everybody that, you know, maybe eating a balanced diet and sort of seeing the, the fungi, fungi or maybe the seaweed as part of a some more holistic approach is probably the more nutritious and beneficial thing. Um, so I just kind of want to you want to add you know my take on that because there's a lot of literature and hype about fungi and people ask me oh this cures this right and I just don't you know I believe there's there's benefits and properties just maybe not to the extent that some companies claim um, I don't think the data back that fully yet as far as uh, other nutrients I mean fungi um, yeah, I think I have a lot of nutrition you know what are the advantages of using fungi I think the one of them is the ability of growing fungi on um on side streams right so we can imagine that you know things that are usually thrown out like uh for example the the water from a brewery for example which is quite you know quite nutritious and has a lot of various components in it what if i could just go into a fungal a tank where fungi can grow on it so i think the ability to be very circular about how we can grow fungi i think is very attractive you know you can imagine growing them Fungi, I think, in, in places where, ag with, where traditional agriculture can be challenging. So, you know, arid places, right? Um, astronauts, you know, people are really thinking about how mycelium could be a space food for expeditions to Mars. I think there's something there about kind of um, extreme environments that aren't favorable for traditional agriculture. Fungi could play a role there. Um, I think fungi also, uh, you know, have very, ex they have, have great nutritional value. You know, they're more closely related to to um, to animals than plants are right so so fungi have kind of more similar nutrient requirements um, like like to humans than maybe plants do so they you know a lot of fungi have all the essential amino acids in them um, that's something that not all plants actually have so we have to supplement so that's some, I think something that makes fungi exciting um, and then finally I think the texture I think the textural element is really important uh, to consider that fungi have this element of texture that's encoded in their morphology. You know, that is something that I think we're missing a little bit sometimes in these alternatives is really that sense of texture and fungi can, can offer that. And in fact, if you look in the literature, the anthropological literature, there's all these beautiful uh, studies describing cultural associations between fungi and meat. So, you know, uh, uh, people, uh, scholars uh, who spend time in, in East Africa have noticed that the word for fungus when people forage is the same as um, the word for meat in, among specific tribes in Malawi. And I think this kind of shows sort of a broader association that we have, that, that there's something about fungi that, that feels meaty, that feels, you know, hits just that, that, that right point in terms of texture. Um, so that's, that's my plug. But of course, there's, there's also challenges for, with fungi, like all, all sort of future food sources, and, and we'll have to think about those as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so kind of backpacking off of that, piggybacking, not backpacking, although that sounds fun too. <laughs> for California, like piggyback is backpacking. <laughs> <laughs> so um piggybacking off of that we mushrooms as you said and and but aren't the mushrooms the fruity body which isn't usually the mycelium is that correct so yeah, go for it. Are, yeah so let, this is kind of i think it's something that comes up like hey, what's mycelium and what's yeah you know mushroom is made out of mycelium so i want to clarify that mushrooms are made out of hyphae that come together and make mycelium it's just that that mycelium looks different from the mycelium of non-fruiting, you know, fruiting state, right? So it's the same material, it's the same components. They're just sort of coming together and compressing and forming this very distinct shape that has a different material property and texture. Um, so both, you know, mycelium is, is everything is mycelium, um, but not all mycelium is mushrooms. Is everything. <laughs> Got it. Okay. 
that clears it up. It really does. Cause we're talking about how mushrooms are meaty and I'm a vegan. So I eat mushrooms fried, like the oyster mushrooms and you know, there's, Legendary. I do all that. So I know it's so delicious, but, um, you know, it's also interesting because not everybody likes that texture. Right. So this is one of those, like, okay, how do we turn it into something that people actually also will like? Um, so that's great. And then as it relates also piggy, I wanted to piggyback with these two questions, although they're totally different. Do you see mycelium becoming a major component in our diet, despite not being very rich in protein? Although you did just say that the thing about the amino acids, um, that, um, so is that true that did you say that they're not that rich in protein? It's actually a misconception that mycelium okay. is not rich in protein. What I will say that mushrooms are not uh, rich in protein because they have so much water, right? So a mushroom right. is basically water trapped inside a mycelium. And so yes, by by you know by by weight, mushrooms don't have a lot of protein actually. However, mycelium, it. when it's grown in liquid, for example, the way that we, I showed a, a film or a photo in my presentation of, you know, this mass that's growing in liquid, uh, this is the mycelium, not a mushroom, it's the hyphae and the filaments growing. Uh, there it can be really high in protein up to, you know, as high as 40, 50% uh, of the biomass. And so uh, in that case, it's a quite, you know, it's a quite decent uh, protein and food source. Um, however, as I said, mushrooms are a lot of water. And so, yes, yeah. the sort of protein value is diluted, but when we grow them in a tank, it looks different. So I just want to kind of clarify that that's something that comes up a lot. Perfect. A lot of these questions are just clarification questions it seems like, because yeah, they're full of protein and that's great. And they are my mushrooms are mycelium. That's awesome. Thank you for clearing that up by you. A fruit version of mycelium. Got it. All right, so uh, we've got a couple more questions for you, Amanda, and many of them are sort of around um, the health implications of eating seaweed. So, you know, are there any health risks for overconsumption of seaweed-based meats, you know, such as there are, um, you know, some, some current health uh, risks with purchased seaweed? I think basically, you know, we're interested in knowing, you know, what, whether seaweed absorbs mercury or other pollutants that would then be passed on to people, um, you know, pollutants, uh, heavy metals, other contaminants, things like that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so heavy metals is something that uh, that's always on people's minds coming from something from the ocean, especially the mercury question. Um, and I, I have two answers to that. One is that, um, you know, mercury, where, where it gets really dangerous is when it goes up the food chain. So, uh, you know, it, it gets concentrated um, from animals that eat plants that have mercury and then bigger animals eat those animals and it gets more and more concentrated. So that's where we really start to worry about getting high concentrations of mercury. Um, but seaweed, seaweed lives in, uh, in waters and if there's metals, um, it, it will pull those up. So the first thing that we look for when we're thinking about a food product is where is the seaweed grown? We wanna make sure that it's grown in clean waters. So just like we wouldn't, we wouldn't grow our, our corn on a super fun site, we wanna make sure that we don't grow our seaweed um, in anywhere that, that would have contaminated waters. And so as a food product, we have strict, um, strict regulations on what we will use. So when we purchase our seaweed, we purchase seaweed off the market right now for our products, um, we have to get a spec sheet to make sure that there's no heavy metals. And then we also, once we make our product, we test our, our final protein powder to make sure there's no heavy metals um, because of course it's a concern. Um, and then health risks, one of the most common health risks that people see with eating, uh, overeating seaweed is the iodine content. So that's something that we also think about. In general, um, the iodine is, is much higher in brown seaweeds than reds. So for us, uh, as we're using red seaweeds right now, it's, it's not nearly as much of a concern, but we do, um, we do look at those numbers. So that's something that when we get our final protein powder, we, we evaluate that. Um, and then the last answer to that question is, as we go through the regulatory process, so our protein powder is, is going through the regulatory process of generally recognized as safe with the FDA, one thing that we look at as we go through that is how much of our protein powder would we expect somebody to eat in one sitting, and then and figure that the answer out to that question. So I'd say we're still at that process, but right now um, in our bacon or our burgers, it's a, it's a small amount of protein powder that we're using, um, especially if we want to get that red color uh, in our burgers or our bacon. So 
you would have to eat a lot of uh, a lot of bacon or uh, a whole lot of burger in order to to get more than you would normally eat in a in a regular sitting. But the, the actual numbers is something that we're uh, we're coming up with now of, of where we want to make sure we we keep our serving sizes. Got it. Thanks, Amanda. Um, sort of related to bacon specifically, a couple comments came in. One, you know, is uh, you know, animal-based bacon has pretty high salt content. So um, somebody was curious to know what the salt content of Umaro's bacon was. And then uh, you talked a little bit about this in your in your presentation about using hydrocolloids uh, to sort of mimic the the fat uh, content. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and what your flavoring process is like for for getting that fat into bacon? Sure, sure. So pretty soon we're actually redoing our website. So pretty soon we're going to have a really cool section that shows all of our ingredients with some nice pictures and, and descriptions. But uh, until that point. Um, the salt content in our bacon is, is similar to normal bacon. Um, uh, I, I should say that with our bacon, nobody considers bacon a health food and neither do we. We're, we're trying to, our top priority is getting something out there that's delicious. And so we're essentially targeting the same nutritional value, which means around the same fat, um, the same salts, the, the same protein. Right now we're working on bumping up that protein to get our numbers a little more similar. For our fat right now, we use a, a mix of coconut oil and sunflower oil, so a, a mix of a, a solid and a liquid fat. And then we use that hydrocolloid essentially like a, a matrix that encapsulates that fat so that you, um, you really get a really nice texture. And that's something different than anything else on the market right now. So most of the other uh, bacons on the market right now are more like a, a tasty bacon cracker, or they're like a melty coconut oil uh, uh, strip. And so that's, uh, we've uh, managed to use the seaweed hydrocolloids to really encapsulate that fat and make something that, that essentially solves both those problems. Awesome. Uh, you know, I, I am not vegan myself, but my husband is. And so I eat a lot of vegan bacon. I'm looking forward to trying Umaro's products. <laughs> uh, Dean, Excellent. talk to you. <laughs> awesome. Thank Me too. <laughs> if you ever need any taste testers, you know where to go. <laughs> so um, Vayu, how is using genetic engineering more affordable than adding other ingredients to fungi? That's a great question. And, you know, we could really have a a whole midday science cafe on the topic of genetic engineering and GMO. I think that, uh, you know, has a lot of angles to it. And it's a very important and interesting topic that involves, you know, scientists and policymakers and people from very different backgrounds. So I won't tackle that, you know, fully here, but I think the, uh, so when thinking about, in, in thinking of this genetic engineering, uh, I think if we could eliminate some of these processing steps, which requires quite large infrastructure and can be complex, uh, you know, for example, if you're trying to add a powder, egg white, for example, into a thousand kilos of wet mycelium, that is not a, that's, that's, not, that's not a trivial uh, process. It's stirring, distributing, all of that takes a lot of labor, effort, and engineering. And so the idea is that if we could eliminate some of those steps, we could save costs and maybe also make it more closely related to the thing that we're trying to mimic. Uh, this, you know, you can think about such a thing as texture, for example. If we could just um, maybe knock out the genes or just you know, eliminate the gene in the genome that controls how the hyphae grow and how the hyphae branch and connect, you know, may, maybe it's, sorry, my charger keeps falling up. It's, it, would, it could be possible to have a texture that's already ideal, right? That very little or nothing would need to be added because the fungus has sort of um, a morphology or a, a structure to it that, that is so friendly and delicious to our mouth that we don't have to add stuff. So I think, I think that's where we're thinking genetic engineering could, could really be powerful. It's eliminating some steps making it, and then making it closer to the real thing. Finally, genetic engineering might be able to be used to increase, to change the nutritional value. So this has been done in rice. There's a product called golden rice, which has been engineered to overproduce uh, carotenoids and, and vitamins that are scarce in, in regions where rice is grown. And so the idea there is that, you know, maybe fungi similarly could have, uh, could be encoded or modified for just increased nutritional value, which could really help populations where food access is a challenge. So um, I think there's many elements to it. I think we're still very early 
and you know this is an academic endeavor right now so testing what is possible what can we do and i think sort of there, there will be many questions along the way of, of the potential challenges and merits of this um, and i'm really you know glad that this question was brought up yeah and actually there is that second question and i you know which is what are those challenges do you foresee you know to having really genetic engineering solutions drive the products in the market um this product and potentially other products um and i know you said we could have a whole nother midday science cafe about this specifically but do, can you think of some of those challenges i think or maybe the biggest challenges yeah you yeah i think i think one thing is i think i want to kind of put out there that I think you know genetic engineering, genetically modified food has gotten a really bad reputation, and I think we, you know, as a scientist, I sort of want to say that I'm not opposed inherently to the process of genetic modification. You know, I don't think there's nothing inherently wrong with that sort of as an experiment, as an approach. I think you know where where things become challenging and it becomes you know becomes a question is okay who owns you know that genetic material you know who has access to that how you know how is this actually capitalized and, and owned uh, how does this interact with wild varieties right in, in the land in the, in the world of plants you know a genetically modified crop how does that actually interact with the in surrounding ecosystems you know those are really important considerations and i think there's been a lot of um, kind of mistakes that have been made and, and challenges that have been encountered on that broader level but I will say that, you know, we have been genetically modifying food forever. We just haven't had the tools that we have accessible now. So, for example, corn is actually originated from a grass called teosinte in Central America. Teosinte is a grass that has baby mini, maybe what looks kind of like corn. And the Aztecs and the, and the sort of the indigenous peoples living in Central America through breeding and mixing you know, eventually ended up with something like corn. That was genetic engineering. They changed the genetic material, but through sort of a very long hundred year or so process of breeding and mixing seeds. The same thing is true for cabbage and Brussels sprouts and kale. That all comes from sort of the same ancestor. And we just bred it to look, you know, like a small ball or a big ball or very leafy. And now we have different tools and different kind of, uh, uh, yeah, equipment and expertise available at our disposal. And so I think we're just able to accelerate and be more precise about the process. And you know, where, where that leads and sort of the policy implications and the environmental implications, that is a really important question. And we, we should really be aware and think about that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I kind of want to bring up the nuances in this area of food and genetic engineering. No, I think that that's perfect time and place to bring that up. Um, and before I hand things back over to Jen, I just want to say we got a request for some literature um, about how people can learn more if they're interested in your field value and your field, Amanda. So um, maybe after this, we can come, uh, you can maybe compile a few things that we can send out to the audience about learning more about these fields. Um, and we again, we can send that out after when we send out the videos and things. So yeah, go ahead, Jen. So I, we realized we are actually almost at 1.30. I'm gonna to toss one more question to both of you and then we'll wrap up. Um, but this is an interesting one that has gotten some media attention recently. How do you think you know, mycelium and other proteins like seaweed compares to insects being used as a, as a food or a protein source? Tough question. Um, yeah, you know, I've seen uh, I've seen a lot of the new press. I've I've had some of the products uh, uh, come into my cabinets um, with mixed results for me personally. Um, but you know, my my understanding of the insect protein is that uh, a lot of it is also um, really high in protein and um, you know probably equally healthy. From uh, from my personal perspective, my goal is to. Um, you know, remove remove living things from uh, from our food source as much as possible. But I think from a, a climate perspective, uh, from what I've seen, the environmental impact is lower with um, with the insect proteins. So, for me personally, I'm still on plant based as much as possible. But from the the climate side of things, it, it looks promising for insect proteins. Yeah, I I think I'm I'm definitely you know on on a similar page like Amanda. I think. You know, if it can be the most delicious and if it can be affordable and truly sustainable, you know, that's great. That, that's interesting. That's exciting. 
um, yeah, similar to Amanda, I've personally tried quite a few, you know, cricket based things and so forth. And, um, you know, it's, it's mixed results for me too. And I do think sort of one um, additional layer to insects that, uh, that we can think about in the United States where insects are, you know, in the United States specifically, there's places in the world where insects are part of the diet regularly. In the United States, you know, it isn't. And so how do we kind of overcome that cultural sort of association between what is food and what isn't? And so seaweed and fungi, you know, is something maybe that's closer to what we think of as a food source on a daily basis. And so I think, you know, when we think about the future of food, when we think about what is the next gen protein, we cannot forget that food is so tied to our culture, our, our identity and who we are. And so, you know, even though we're hacking food and designing food, you know, that is still a big part of the conversation and the equation for me. And so that's something that comes up for me personally with insects. I'm excited to see where yeah. it goes. Definitely. Well, that brings us to the end of our event. Um, before we close, I just want to thank uh, Bayou and Amanda one more time for their great presentations and our audience for showing up and, and asking so many fascinating questions. I wish we could keep talking about this, uh, but we're at time. So uh, as Dee mentioned, and she's got up on the screen, our next Midday Science Cafe is April 21st, just in time for Earth Day, Earth Week, Earth Month. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing from our two researchers who are going to be uh, talking about creating plastics that can be infinitely recycled, as well as biodegradable plastics that are truly compostable. Um, as always, you can stay up to date on research coming out of both of our institutions at uh, scienceatcal.berkeley.edu and lbl.gov. With that, we'll wrap up. We'll say thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you to our speakers and our audience. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you all for Bye, everybody. questions. Bye. Great questions.